his volume four of Maria Valtorta's The Poem of Man God, episode 471, written on the 15th of August, 1944. The title is Cure of the Boy Born Blind, from Sidon. I see Jesus come out of a synagogue surrounded by his apostles and by a crowd of people. I realize that it is a synagogue because through the wide open door I can see the same furniture that I saw in the synagogue of Nazareth in one of the visions preparing for Passover. The synagogue is in the main square of the village, a bare square surrounded only by houses, with a basin in the center nourished by a fountain pouring lovely clear water from only one jet of stone carved like a bent tile. The basin is used to water quadrupeds and many doves which fly by from house to house. The fountain to, um, the, from house to house, the fountain to fill the jugs of women, beautiful copper amphorae, some of which are hammered, some smooth, all shining in the sun, because it is sunny and warm. The earth of the square is dry and yellowish, as when it is parched by strong sunshine. There is not even one tree in the square. But branches of fig trees and vine shoots hang out over the little square of orchards along the four roads which depart from the square. It must be the end of summer and the end of a day, because ripe bunches of grapes are hanging from the pergolas, and sunbeams are not perpendicular, but oblique, as at sunset. In the square some people are waiting for Jesus, but I do not see any miracle among them. Jesus passes, he bends over them, he blesses and comforts them, but does not cure them, at least for the time being. There are also women with children, and men of all ages. They appear to be known to the Master, who greets them, calling them by their names. <clears throat> and they crowd round him with familiarity. Jesus caresses the children, bending lovingly over them. In a corner of the square is a woman with a little boy or girl. They are all dressed alike with light-colored little tunics. She does not seem to come from here. I would say that she is of higher social standing than the others. Her dress is more elaborate with braids and folds. It is not the plain tunic of ordinary women, women with only a cordon to adorn and shape it. This woman, instead, is wearing an elaborate dress, which, although not a masterpiece like the garments of Mary Magdalene, is very graceful. She has a light veil on her head, much lighter than the other women's veils, which are made of thin linen fabric, whereas hers is almost muslin, so light it is. It is gracefully pinned at the middle of her head, displaying her well-combed brown hair, with locks plaited in a simple fashion, but with more skilled care than those of the other women, whose dresses are in a knot on the napes of their neck, or form a circle round their heads. On her shoulders she has a real mantle, that is, a cloth, which I do not know whether it is sewn or woven in a round shape, with around the neck a braid ending in a silver clasp. The cloth of the mantle falls in beautiful wide folds down to her ankles. The woman is holding by the hand the little boy or girl I mentioned previously, a lovely boy about seven years old, he is also strong, but not in the least lively. He is standing very quietly beside his mother, his hand in hers, with his head lowered, without taking an interest in what is happening. The woman is watching, but she dare not approach the group which has gathered round Jesus. She seems undecided, as while she is urged by her desire to go, she is afraid of moving forward. She then decides to take a middle course, to attract Jesus' attention. She sees him take in his arms a beautiful, big, rosy, smiling baby whom a mother has offered him and whom he dandles, pressing him to his heart while speaking to a little old man. She bends over her little boy and says something to him. The boy raises his head. I now see a sad little face with closed eyes. He is blind. Have mercy on me, Jesus, he says. The infantile little voice cleaves the still air of the square and arrives as far as the group with its lament. Jesus turns round and sees him. He moves at once with loving care. He does not even hand back to its mother the child he is holding in his arms. Tall and most handsome as he is, he goes towards the blind boy, who, after crying, has lowered his head again in, in vain, urged by his mother to repeat the cry. Jesus is now before the woman. He looks at her. She also looks at him. Then she timidly lowers her eyes. Jesus helps her. He has handed the child he had in his arms to the woman who gave it to him. Woman, is this your son? Yes, Master, he is my firstborn. Jesus caresses his bent head. Jesus does not seem to have noticed the blindness of the little one, but I think that he does so deliberately, to let the mother make her request. So the Most High has blessed your house with numerous children, and giving you the firstborn sacred to the Lord. I have only one son, this one, and three girls, and I will not have any more, she sobs. Why are you weeping, woman? Because my son is blind, Master, and you would like him to be able to see? Can you believe? 
I do believe, Master. I was told that you have opened eyes which were closed. But my boy was born with dried eyes. Look at him, Jesus. There is nothing under his eyelids. Jesus raises towards himself the little face, prematurely serious, and looks closer, lifting the eyes with his eyelids with his thumb. There are empty spaces under them. He resumes speaking, holding with his hand the little face raised towards himself. Why have you come then, woman? Because I know that it is more difficult for my boy, but if it is true that you are the expected one, you can do it. Your father created the worlds. Could you not make two eyes for my child? Do you believe that I come from the Father, the Most High Lord? I believe it, and I believe that you can do everything. Jesus looks at her as if he wished to evaluate how much faith there is in her, and how pure her faith is. He smiles. He then says, Child, come to me. And he takes him by the hand to a little wall about half a meter high, built on the road against the house, a kind of parapet to protect it from the road, which is a bend just there. When the boy is steady on the wall, Jesus becomes grave and imposing. The crowds press round him the boy and the anxious mother. I see Jesus from one side in profile. He is all enveloped in his very dark blue mantle, which he wears over a tunic a little lighter in shade. His face is inspired. He looks taller and even sturdier, as is usual when the power of miracles emanates from him. But this time he seems more imposing. He lays his hands open on the boy's head and places his thumbs against the hollow eye sockets. He raises his head, praying per fer fervently, but without moving his lips. He is certainly conversing with his father. He then says, See, I want it, and praise the Lord. And to the woman, let your faith be rewarded. Here is your son, who will be your honor and your peace. Show him to your husband. He will love you once again, and your house will be blessed with further happy days. The woman, who has uttered a shrill cry of joy when the divine thumb, thumb, thumbs being removed from the empty eye sockets, two deep blue wonderful eyes like those of the master, look at her full of wonder and happiness. Under the fringe of dark hair, cries once again, and although she still presses her son against her heart, she kneels at Jesus' feet, saying, Are you aware also of that? Ah, you really are the Son of God. And she kisses his mantle and sandals, and then stands up transfigured with joy, and says, Listen, everybody, I have come from the distant land of Sidon. I came because another mother spoke to me of the rabbi of Nazareth. My husband, a Jewish merchant, has stores in that town to trade with Rome. He is rich and faithful to the law but he has no longer loved me since I, since I, after giving him an unhappy boy, gave birth to three girls, and then I became barren. He left the house, and although I had not been repudiated, I was living in the same situation as if I had been divorced, and I was already aware that he wanted to get rid of me, to have another woman, on, an heir, capable of carrying on his trade and enjoying his wealth. Before coming here I went to my husband and I said to him, Wait, sir, wait until I come back. If I come back and my son is still blind, you may repudiate me. Otherwise do not break my heart and do not deny your children a father. And he swore to me, By the glory of the Lord, woman, I swear to you that if you bring back my son cured, I do not know how you will be able to do that, as your womb was not able to give him eyes. I will come back to you as in the days of our first love. The master did not know of my grief as a wife, and yet he comforted, comforted me also in that respect. Glory be to God and to you, master and king. The woman is on her knees once again and is weeping for joy. Go, tell Daniel, your husband, that he who created the world has given two bright stars as eyes to the little one, sacred to the Lord, because God is faithful to his promises and has sworn that he who believes in him will see all kinds of wonders. Let him now be faithful to his oath, and let him not commit a sin of adultery. Tell Daniel that. Go, be happy. I bless you and this child, and with you I bless all those who are dear to you. The crowd is a chorus of praises and congratulations, and Jesus goes into a nearby house to rest. The vision ends thus, and I can assure you that I was deeply moved by it. Jesus says, God always surpasses the requests of his children when they have faith in him, and gives them even more. Believe it, and let everybody believe it. To the woman who came to me from Sidon with two swords piercing the secret of her heart, and who dared to tell me the name of only one of them, I gave also a second miracle, because it is more grievous to reveal certain intimate misfortunes than to say, I am not well. In the eyes of the world it may have seemed, and may still seem, much easier to establish reconciliation between husband and wife, separated by a reason which has been satisfactorily overcome, than to give two eyes to someone born without them. But it is not so. It is most simple for the Lord and Creator to make two eyes, just as simple as to give the breath of life back to a corpse. 
the master of life, life and of death, the master of everything there is in creation, does not does certainly not lack the breath of life to be instilled into two dead bodies or two drops of humor for a dry, uh, into dead bodies or two drops of humor for a dried eye. If he wants, he can, because it depends exclusively on his power. But when it is a matter of reconciliation between men, the will of men is required together with the desire of God. God only rarely does violence to human freedom. As a rule, he lets you act as you wish. That woman, who lived in a country of idolaters, and, like her husband, remained faithful to the God of her fathers, already deserves benignity from God. And she deserved a double miracle, because she carried her faith beyond the limit of human measure, and overcame the doubts and denials of most Jewish believers, which is proved by what she said to her husband, Wait until I come back. And she was certain of going back with her son cured, she deserved also the difficult miracle of opening the eyes of her husband's spirit, as those eyes had become blind to love and to her grief, as they laid on her a blame which is not a blame. I would also like wives in particular to meditate on the respectful humility of their sister. I went to my husband, and I said to him, Wait, sir. She was in the right, because to blame a mother for a birth defect is foolish and cruel. Her heart was already rent by the sight of her unhappy child. She is doubly in the right because she was neglected by her husband since she became barren, and she was aware of his intentions to divorce her, and yet she remained his wife. That is, the faithful companion, submissive to her companion, as prescribed by God and taught by the Scriptures. She did not harbor thoughts of rebellion or thirst for revenge or intention to find another man in order not to be the lonely woman. If I do not come back with my son cured, you can repudiate me. Otherwise, do not break my heart, and do not deny your children a father. Do you not seem to be hearing Sarah and ancient Hebrew women speak thus? How different, O wise, is your present language, and how different, too, is what you get from God and from your husbands. And families are ruined more and more. As usual, in working the miracle, I had to give it a sign to make it more incisive. I had to persuade a world enclosed in the barriers of an age-old way of thinking, led by a sect hostile to me. Hence the necessity for making my supernatural power shine clearly. But the teaching of the vision does not consist in that. It consists in the faith, humility, faithfulness to one's consort, in the right path undertaken, O wives and mothers who have found thorns where you expected to have roses, to see new flowery branches grow on the thorns which prick you. Turn to your Lord God who created marriage so that man and woman might not be alone and might love each other forming one only indissoluble body since they were joined together, and who gave you the sacrament so that his blessing might descend upon your marriage, and through my merits you may have what you need in your new life of consorts and procreators, and in order to be able to turn to him with confident faces and souls, be honest, good, respectful, faithful, true companions of your husbands, not just guests in their houses, or worse still, strangers which chance has gathered under one roof, like two who meet by chance in a hotel of pilgrims. That happens too often nowadays. Does man make a mistake? He is wrong, but that does not justify the behavior of too many wives. And you are even less justified when you do not render good for good and love for love to a kind companion. I will not even take into consideration the too common cause of your carnal unfaithfulness, which makes you like prostitutes, with the aggravating circumstance that you are hypocritically vicious and you pollute the family altar around which are the angelical souls of your innocent children. But I refer to your moral unfaithfulness, to the pact of love sworn before my altar. Well, I said, he who looks at a woman with lustful desire commits adultery in his heart. I said, he who dismisses his wife with a libel of divorce exposes her to adultery. But now that too many wives are strangers to their husbands, I say, those who do not love their companions with their souls, minds, and bodies incite them to adultery. And if I ask such husbands why, the, why they committed adultery, I will also ask their wives the same question, because although they do not perform it, they cause it. It is necessary to understand the law of God in its full extent and depth, and it is necessary to live it in full, in tr full truthfulness. Remain in my peace. The above does not apply to you, and keep your heart fixed in mine.